This is Thank You Mama Weekly Lessons for Mothers All Around the World. Hi and welcome to Thank You Mama. My name is Anna Tider. My guest today is Gail Brandeis. She's the author of the novel in poems called Many Restless Concerns and the memoir The Art of Misdiagnosis, Surviving My Mother's Suicide as well as several novels, a poetry collection, and a writing guide. Her essay collection, Drawing Breath, will be released in 2023, and I consider myself very privileged because I just got to read it and finish it and loved it, and I'm very happy to have Gail here talking to us today. And Gail has, Gail's work has appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, Salon, and more. And Gail has won numerous and very prestigious awards for her writing. Gail, hi. Welcome. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so delighted to be here today. I'm I'm very, very excited because of our moms. Yes. <laughs> Gail, do we also want to share with my listeners what you just told me about uh, how we random picked the day today? Yes, it's it's kind of amazing. I had chills through my whole body when I realized the significance of the day of our interview. Somehow when we scheduled it, I wasn't thinking about where it fell on the calendar, but today is actually the 13th anniversary of my mom's suicide. Mm. And as I mentioned to you before we started recording, it feels really good to be focusing on gratitude on this day. Mm -hmm. I think as more time has passed, I'm able to, I felt a lot of anger toward my mom after her suicide and our relationship was so complicated, but, but I've been leaning more toward gratitude over the past several years and that feels so much better. And so I love that I can mark today this painful anniversary mm. with, gratitude for my mom because mm. she did give me so much. Mm. Gail, you said that you started feeling better and, and, and going towards gratitude. And I have a quote from your recent book that says, Babe, by the time I was done writing my memoir, I appreciated my mom more deeply than I ever had when she was alive. And, and you just mentioned this gratitude and the healing process. Tell me a little bit about how writing helped you to heal from this trauma. Sure. Um, it was such a tremendous healing process for me, writing about my mother's death. Writing has always been a way through which I've been able to process my life. It's how I know what I know or <laughs> how I understand what I'm feeling about certain things. And when I started writing about my mom and her suicide, as I mentioned, I was feeling so much anger toward her, which is a really common thing to feel after a suicide loss. You know, just in my grief, I I couldn't understand why she had done what she did, why she left us that way, how she could have left us right after I had a baby since I had given birth one week before her death. Mm. And writing helped me burn through that. It helped, it helped me feel that anger and let it go. And on the other side of that anger was compassion and gratitude. And compassion was harder in some ways than anger because it was a broken hearted feeling and there's a lot of, you know, a deep pain in that broken hearted feeling, but it also felt better than anger because I could access my love for her. And I think in spending time writing about her, it helped me see what an amazing person she had been. <laughs> and I think, I think I had known, I had known that in her life, but I hadn't fully known it. I hadn't let myself see the full scope of her creativity, her, her vision, her energy. Writing about her helped me see that and see that she really took creative risks in her life. She really trusted in herself in her life and, and took leaps that I think were pretty amazing. And I love that I'm able to see that now and feel that now and was able to get beyond that pain and grief and mm -hmm. anger. Although the grief still comes up, of mm -hmm. course, but, mm -hmm. 
that I could find some beauty on the other side of mm. that. Um, that means so much to me. Gail, how soon after you've lost her have you written your memoir? How long did you need to be ready? It took about a year and a half to be able to write with any sort of sustained focus. Mm -hmm. I could write little bits here and there up until that point, but the freshness of the grief and also the freshness of having a new baby yes, and yeah. you know not sleeping much and you know just dealing with all of that just postpartum body and mind stuff it was hard to find time to write or find the brain space to write and so it was about a year and a half when i could start to to take more strides into the work. There were certain scenes that took me years to get to mm -hmm. because they mm -hmm. were just too hard and painful. Mm -hmm. And I had to to sort of wait until I was ready to write those scenes. And I would say it took about five years to write the hardest parts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How long did it take to write the whole novel? Uh, memoir, sorry. Um, I guess it was about seven years. Mm -hmm. Tell me about it. We heard the title. I'd mm -hmm. love you to tell to tell my listeners a little bit about it. And then about the upcoming book. Sure. The Art of Misdiagnosis takes its title from a documentary my mom was working on at the time of her death. She had almost completed it, but hadn't quite completed it yet. And my sister and I actually were able to to do the post-production stuff, or we hired someone to do the post-production stuff to complete this this project that was so meaningful to her, um, her documentary was, it was called The Art of Misdiagnosis because it was about art that she created later in life. She had always been an, an art aficionado. She had appreciated art from the outside. She was a docent at various museums and things like that. And art and creativity were, you know, just something she introduced me and my sister to at a young age. But she wasn't a practitioner of the arts until later in life when she said she felt the spirits of her family coming through her. She had been estranged from her family. And so this was really powerful for her to feel as if her relatives wanted to wanted her to create art about them. Mm -hmm. And so she made paintings that were about her family and the diseases that she thought ran rampant through her side of the family. She had a delusional disorder. And so it's hard to know whether these diseases were actually part of the family. But she wanted to raise awareness about these diseases, too. And so this documentary was about her art, but also about uh, Ehlers-Danlos and porphyria, the two diseases she thought were part of our family. What do they do? Ehlers-Danlos is a connective tissue disorder mm -hmm. that has various manifestations. At the time, it was rarely diagnosed and was considered a rare disease. And she had this intuition that it wasn't a rare disease It just was rarely diagnosed. Mm. And it's interesting that she was kind of right about that. Mm -hmm. um, I think about seven people in my life I know who have been diagnosed with it in the last few years. And suddenly it it seems like it is um, a more prevalent, including my husband has it as a possible diagnosis, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which she thought like she she saw that years ago. And it's only now that that he's starting to um be investigated for having it mm -hmm. so that's yeah it can manifest itself in cardiac ways and and other ways porphyria is a metabolic disorder that she thought that I had and I did have a borderline positive test for it as a teenager but then later it was not found mm -hmm. in my body um, and that has various manifestations as well mm -hmm. but the the title of the art of misdiagnosis ended up working for me mm -hmm in a different way than it did for her because she and I have this long history with misdiagnosis and, and diagnosis where as a teenager, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. She thought that it was a misdiagnosis. Oh my goodness, it's, it's a very complicated story. But yeah. I, I had been very sick for a year. And then when I went into remission, I didn't know how to be a real teenager in the world. And so I pretended to be sick for another year. Mm. And 
it became sort of later someone described it to me as a contract between me and my mom, an unspoken contract where Mm -hmm. I was the sick girl and she was the mother of the sick girl. And those were Mm -hmm. our identities and neither of us knew how to move beyond those identities. So I Mm -hmm. perpetuated those identities for longer than I needed to. Mm -hmm. So that, that plays into my borrowing her title for my own book. So that becomes a thread. So it's it's sort of looking at that history of, you know, the sick girl history, but also surviving her suicide. Mm. I want to ask where the paintings are. Do you still have those paintings? I have three of them up mm-hmm. in my house. Um, we recently moved back to the Chicago area mm-hmm. where I grew up. I haven't lived in this area since 86. Mm-hmm. And... It feels, I hadn't been able to display her work for a while. Mm -hmm. And then Mm -hmm. at some point I took out one painting and it felt okay to have one painting out. Mm -hmm. But now I have three of them up in the house and it feels really good to have her presence on the walls and her creativity informing our space. Because as an art concept, I think it sounds amazing. Making paintings about family diseases, (laughs) just I haven't seen them, but as a concept... It's it's fantastic. They're very powerful, mm. and they're so powerful that I was <laughs> I mm. couldn't even look at them yeah. for a long time. But now, that. now um, there's one that's that's actually a little separate from these diseases called Rochelle's Rhapsody. That is a painting. The background is inspired by Jackson Pollock with you know the drip mm-hmm. painting, mm-hmm. but then she created this sort of half halo that's silver and has these sort of radiant rays coming out of it, and it's it's to represent the electroshock therapy that her, her sister received mm-hmm. as a young woman, and that has a whole complicated mm-hmm. history too mm-hmm. because my mother became romantically involved with her sister's psychiatrist starting when my mom was 16 years old and she considered that that psychiatrist to be the love of her life even though you know he could be considered a pedophile yeah. um, since yeah. she was 16 when their relationship began mm-hmm. so yeah it's a, a multi-layered history Mm -hmm. for her in this painting but even though that that painting has a lot of painful history in it the word rhapsody is part of the title Rochelle's Rhapsody and she um she painted it listening to Rhapsody in Blue Mm -hmm. and there is a sort of rhapsodic feel to that painting Mm -hmm. even with the painful stuff attached Mm -hmm. to it Mm that's in our dining room now Mm. before we jump into drawing breath um I know this is maybe a silly, complex question. How did you heal after after that shock and of, of losing her and the fact that she took her life and you had a little baby on your hands? I, maybe it's too complex to, to answer, but maybe it's not. Maybe, maybe you can share something. Oh, sure. It's not a silly question at all. I think it's a <laughs> profound question. And I think it's a combination of a lot of things. I think writing certainly was a big part of the healing process for me. Therapy certainly um, was important in in helping to work through some of the feelings. And in fact, one of the most powerful parts of it ended up in the book where my therapist recommended writing a letter to my mom as a way of asking questions and keeping a relationship with her even after she was gone. And so writing a letter to her was really helpful. And that letter became part of my book. Talking with my sister who was with me when we when my mom disappeared and then mm-hmm. um, when we got the news, she was there. And so we had to do a lot of talking and of course she had her own therapy and we, we just processed stuff together. That was super important. And I think time and perspective helped too. Um, but also there are tremendous resources at the American foundation um, for suicide prevention. They have a whole section on suicide loss And that was really helpful for me, the various resources. I read a lot of books about suicide loss, um, such as Joan Wickersham's The Suicide Index, which was about her father's suicide, and other other books um, about suicide loss that helped me see that it was possible to survive such a loss, and it was possible to turn that pain 
into art Mm -hmm. because I knew that was, even if I never published it, I knew that writing was going to to be helpful to me and seeing models of how other people had done it was, was really um, an important part of my own healing process. Mm. Mm. Um, Let's talk about drawing breath. Drawing breath is coming out soon in February, 2023. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy how time flies. It's only in two, it in two months. That's um, wild. A beautiful, beautiful book of essays. Thank you. Yes. Tell me a little about it. Sure. Um, this collection, it, it's a bit of a retrospective in a way because some of the essays are more than 20 years old. And this book feels like a bonus book to me. It's a book that I hadn't set out to write because I I just, I wrote the individual essays as they came to me, Mm -hmm. not thinking that they'd become part of something bigger. Mm -hmm. And at some point I thought, I have a lot of essays, maybe I should compile them. And as I started looking at at my various essays, I realized how they grouped themselves very naturally into various themes. And the title essay of the collection, Drawing Breath, was a critical paper I had written when I was getting my MFA at Antioch University. I graduated from there in 2001, so over 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's divided into inhales and exhales, where in the inhales, I reflect on my inner world, on my own personal stories, and then the exhales are looking out to the wider world with research about breath and how it connects with writing and creativity. And so that really created a template of sorts for my nonfiction writing that looks both inward and outward, sort of like breath, where it's this interchange between self and world. And I realized because it provided a template for my writing life, it could provide a template for a collection of my essays as well. So I decided to group the essays in a way that mirrored different types of breathing and Because I put this together during COVID, there were all sorts of resonances with breath because COVID is spread by breath. So breath could become a deadly thing. Mm. There was George Floyd's death where he had told the officers he couldn't Mm. breathe Mm. and I can't breathe became a rallying cry at Mm. protests. And then it was co-opted by anti-mask protesters, Mm -hmm. which was, Mm -hmm. you know, just felt really weird and wrong to me. And so breath became this really charged subject. And so it it took on so much more meaning than it ever had before and made the decision to structure the book around breath feel meaningful. So the subtitle essays on writing the body and loss, but I've realized that I, even though I've changed so much over the last 20 years, I have certain writerly obsessions that have stayed pretty constant. So mm-hmm. writing about writing or writing about the body mm-hmm. and and writing as a way of processing loss, those have all been sort of at the core of, of my writing. So even though this book covers a big chunk of time, it also is rooted in those those core obsessions. Mm. Let's tell the readers, the readers here, two writers talking, <laughs> let's talk to tell the listeners about Her Shadow. I was, I, I thought Her Shadow was just so fantastic. How did you manage that? Oh, thank you. That was, that was a really fun, even though it was kind of, it was challenging and painful too, uh, as a process, but I'd been asked to write a book review of the Art of Death by Edward Standicat um, for the San Francisco Chronicle. Mm-hmm. And there was a line that that stuck out for me, and I don't have the book in front of me, so mm-hmm. I don't remember the exact line, but she says something along the lines of, whenever someone writes about their mother, they're really writing about everyone's mother. Mm-hmm. And I thought about that, and it just gave me the idea, like, what if I found sentences other people had written about their mothers and compiled them together to create an essay that was about my mother, but using words from other people about their mothers. So it became this found essay. And I had to comb through. I know. So many it's books. so much work. I started reading this and I'm like, is this what, what I'm really reading? This is a whole essay about your mother 
written through other people's sentences. Yeah. And I, I was wondering how much work was behind it, but it's so beautiful. Thank you. It was a lot of work and I made it easier for myself over time. At first, I really literally flipped through physical pages looking for the phrase, my mother, and writing down the ones I could find. <laughs> um, at some point, I realized, oh, I could do a search on, on Google Books. Mm -hmm. It allows you to see parts of certain books. So I knew which books I wanted to look at. And I did a search term on my mother for those books mm -hmm. and saw which sentences mm -hmm. came out. And then mm -hmm. I was able to find mm -hmm. resonant sentences that way. So it became easier once I discovered I could do that way. <laughs> um, but it was still was a lot of combing yes. and figuring out how yes. to how to organize the sentences together. It really, it felt like putting a puzzle together. So it was different from writing something from scratch. And of course, yeah. I acknowledge yeah. everyone whose work I, <laughs> I used. And I got permission to use all the quotes. And yeah, that felt really meaningful where it became this choral voice of all mm -hmm. these these other writers talking yes. about their mothers, but yeah. but it became an expression about my own mother as well. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah I, I loved doing that. It's what I'm learning through this podcast is that we are actually all speaking in one voice. We're just not aware mm -hmm. of it. We're living one life mm -hmm. and experiencing same things and speaking in one voice. And I wish we were more aware of it because this is where our power comes from and our strength. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's beautiful. But we're so not aware of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's talk about Mama Lean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> tell me a little bit. We we already heard quite a lot about her, but tell me a little bit about her life. So we know sure. she was born in Chicago. I know sure. she was beautiful and she was a model when she was young. Yes. Yes. She was born in 1939 in Chicago. She was the youngest of 10 children born to Benjamin and Gertrude Balin. She had a very close relationship with her mother, I think her relationship with her mother was much closer than any of her siblings' relationships had been. I think maybe because she was the baby of the family. Yeah, it was a family that didn't show a lot of affection, but but my mom was her mom's pet, and mm -hmm. so they were very close, and her mom's death was really difficult for her. It was a very blue-collar family. Her father owned a grocery store and was a butcher within the grocery store. And she wasn't really exposed to much culture. And so when she started dating this psychiatrist when she was 16, he introduced her to the opera, which became a lifelong mm. passion. Um, she actually became a supernumerary at the Lyric Opera in Chicago, which is essentially being an extra. So she got to wear these amazing costumes on stage. <laughs> well, they, you know, she didn't sing or anything, but mm -hmm. she was in the background mm -hmm. and got to be on stage with, you know, these famous opera singers who she mm -hmm. loved. And so as problematic as that relationship was, you know, looking at it from my perspective, he did open a door for her to become someone who, who could participate in the cultural arts and appreciate the cultural arts. And so that, that was always very important to her. Um, she had various business. She was quite an entrepreneur and had a lot of different businesses. Did she get to study? No, no, she did not actually. And in fact, we learned, I think it was after her death that she didn't even graduate from high school. She became ill with uh, rheumatic fever when she was in high school and missed a lot of school. And it sounds like she tried to do a sort of alternative program for a while, but but I don't think she actually graduated. And she never attended college, but she was a lifelong learner. She loved learning. She went to lectures frequently. She took various courses. And so she was she was kind of an autodidact who created her own education in the world. Learning was was super important to her. Um, she instilled a love of reading in me, which I'm grateful for. So she wasn't traditionally well-educated, but she educated herself. What happened? How did she meet your dad and have you and your sister? Oh, well, actually, that, that fits into what we were just talking about. Um, she was taking adult 
education course at the University of Chicago, a great books course that was like an evening course for, you know, a non-degree sort of course studying the great books of Western literature. And her class went to an Ionesco play um, that was on campus. And my dad wasn't part of this program, but his friend was. And his friend invited him to this play. And there was a reception afterwards. And my parents met there. And my dad was smitten with her right away. And I guess asked for her phone number. And uh, when he called, the first thing he said to her was, I love hash brown potatoes. <laughs> and I guess it was a line from the play. And she she was like, what? <laughs> and he said it again. And I think she realized that, you know, she remembered it was a line from the play. And they, they started dating. He was 20 years older than her, although he always looked very youthful for, for his age. And I think, you know, even though it had been a couple of years, I think, since the psychiatrist had died. She was still pining for him. So it took mm -hmm. a while for her to really open her heart to my dad. And he asked her a couple of times to marry him before she said yes. But they did eventually get married. Shortly after my mom's mom died, my mom's mom had a heart attack two months before their wedding. Mm -hmm. And so it was very, very painful for my mom to not have her mom there mm -hmm. at the wedding. And in fact, one of the paintings I have uh, up at my house is called Mom Died Before My Wedding. So that was really painful. They had me a year later and then my sister four years after that. And I was actually conceived in a closet, I learned, <laughs> because um, my dad has two kids from a previous marriage and they were 16 and 18 when I was born. And they were visiting him and my parents, you know, they were actively trying to have a baby and my mom knew she was ovulating. So <laughs> they they snuck into the closet to have me because the, the only bathroom was accessible through my parents' bedroom at the time. <laughs> and yeah, so that's how I was conceived. That's a great story. <laughs> yeah, and they were together until my mom started having delusions that my dad was hiding millions of dollars from mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. Mm. And she tried to kill him at one point with a stun gun, and he moved out after that. But he he never stopped loving her. Mm. And at some point, they started hanging out together again. They never re remarried or anything, but they mm -hmm. became best friends again before mm -hmm. her death. How long after you noticed these delusions, how long did she live with them? I first became aware of her delusions right after my daughter was born. Mm -hmm. So it's it's kind of a wild thing how the delusions surfaced just after my daughter was born. So she was, you know, I think like two weeks old when my mom first came to visit. And suddenly, you know, she was telling me that vans were following her and that my dad was hiding millions of dollars and all this stuff that just... You know, I was not prepared to hear and didn't mm. understand how to process. It was really scary and discombobulating. And and then it lasted for about 16 years until mm -hmm. right after mm -hmm. my son was born. Mm -hmm. um, I have the same sort of age gap in um, my family where just like my older siblings were 16 and 18 when I was born, mm -hmm. my older kids were almost 16 and then 19 when my youngest was born. Let's talk about Mama Lynn's lessons. What yes. were the most important things you think you've learned from her? Oh, my goodness. And let's, she... not, let's not mind the dog. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Hopefully she'll calm down soon. Um, I had learned so much from her. And I think I didn't, I wasn't really aware of all I had learned from her until I wrote my memoir. But I feel like the most important things were... Um, the importance of creativity and how it could be a means of both, you know, expression and meaning, which I'm so grateful, you know, for mm. how I was raised, just going to concerts and museums and plays and things like that and read to all the time. And I saw, you know, just how the arts were so soul filling. Mm -hmm. And I started writing when I was four years old and my, my mother encouraged that so beautifully. So that's, you know, just the importance of the arts is, and creativity. Mm -hmm. So one thing uh, she really 
taught me to trust my intuition. She was a very intuitive person. Sometimes her intuition, you know, was wrapped up with the delusions. And Mm -hmm. so it wasn't always, I think, a true gut instinct. Mm -hmm. But I think that I learned from her that sometimes our gut is the most powerful guide. Would she consciously teach you that? Would would she tell you this? Or did you just learn it through through seeing her? I think it was through example. Yeah, I I don't think she actually said Mm -hmm. that out loud, but Mm -hmm. I I witnessed it Mm -hmm. in her for Mm -hmm. sure. And I, I think the most powerful lesson I received from her was the importance uh, or the power of using one's voice and how our voices could make a difference in the world. And she modeled this for me as a kid um, in some pretty profound ways where when I was in elementary school, she was the, um, the chair of the safety committee in the PTA. And through this, this safety committee at the school, she facilitated a couple of letter writing uh, movements, letter writing mm-hmm. campaigns that made a real impact in our community. Mm-hmm. So the, the first one was to get a traffic light put near the school mm-hmm. at an intersection where there had been some accidents. And you know, of course, children were crossing the street all the time. And um, she and some other mothers just sat in the multi-purpose room, wrote these letters, and the city installed a traffic light there. So I saw that putting words to paper could make things happen. Mm. And then um, the same group wrote letters to, to Kmart, our local Kmart, after there had been some violence in the community. And they were able to get guns and ammunition out of our local Kmart mm. in the 1970s. Fantastic. And yeah, yeah and so... Um, So I saw through her that writing was not just a means of expression, but Mm -hmm. it could be a means of creating change, of uh, instigating change. And so even as as a kid, I would write letters to the editor and various things just because of her example and seeing that if you're upset about something, you can use your voice and you might help change that thing. Mm. Beautiful. Do you have more th- lessons that you'd like to share? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I feel like those sort of are the core ones mm-hmm. for me. There are other things, mm-hmm. too, about just surrounding oneself with inspiring things, too. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, because art was important to her, she she made a beautiful home for us filled with art and interesting objects and and I love having some of those things in my home now, you know, just some of the pictures I grew up with and pieces of furniture I grew up with. And I think that um, she always did a beautiful job of creating a space that was inspiring. Yeah. And she loved to create memorable experiences for people. My sister and her husband were here for Thanksgiving and they were reflecting upon how how much they appreciated that whenever they went to visit her, she always just wanted to make sure they were having a good time and made sure to to put together, you know, good outings and and meals and things like that. And and I think that, you know, I I tend to be a bit of a hermit, so I'm not always <laughs> wanting to host mm-hmm. parties or things like that, even mm-hmm. though I love it when I do it. Mm-hmm. I'm just not a natural hostess, mm-hmm. I think. But mm-hmm. she um she showed, you know, just how to make people feel welcome, even though she also made people feel uncomfortable in, a, in other ways. <laughs> Is there more or should I ask you my trick question? <laughs> um, we can move on to the trick question. I feel like I, I covered the most important Okay. One. So the trick question is and a very important question. Was there something important you wish she taught you, something important you had to learn yourself? Um, There are a few things. (laughs) I I would say maybe at the top of that would be, I wish I had learned healthy boundaries when I was young. It's something I still struggle with. Um, She's someone who didn't respect boundaries and didn't teach boundaries. And as a result, I've, I think, been kind of porous. <laughs> like I've, had, mm-hmm. I've, had, I've had a permeable membrane mm-hmm. <laughs> that at times when um, 
when it would have been healthier to set a clear boundary. And it's something that that has been one of the biggest challenges, I think, of my adult life mm-hmm. is learning how to set and keep keep yes. boundaries that protect my heart mm-hmm. and that just create more clarity for myself and others. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's that's a biggie. Mm-hmm. I think another one too is I never learned how to have disagreements in a healthy way mm-hmm. because I think I grew up in a family that kind of pretended everything was okay and we didn't talk about difficult things. So I didn't really know how to do that. And writing helped me um, Mm -hmm. be able to figure out how to express difficult stuff. Mm -hmm. But if I did try to say something was bothering me, my mom would really make me feel guilty about that. Mm. And and so it was was really hard for me to ever say if something was bothering me uh, later in life with partners and Mm -hmm. things. Um, Mm -hmm. So I wish I had learned how to... Yeah, how to be able to share my truth um, Mm -hmm. in a way that was uncomfortable, like my uncomfortable truths earlier in life and how and how a disagreement did not have to mean the world was going to fall apart because it always I'm so conflict averse. It feels like the world is going to fall apart when there's a disagreement. And Mm -hmm. I've gotten better at it, at at sort of navigating conflict. but I wish I had been given more tools for that early on. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else? (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm sure there, there's much more, but those are the the main ones. That's pretty They're big. (laughs) (laughs) Then let's recap. So I have as lessons you've learned, we heard about creativity and art a source a source of meaning and of joy <laughs> to listen to your intuition how beautiful is that and how important i love that one um that your voice can make a difference and i wrote down writing is means of instigating change i love that <laughs> through the letters she was writing to the authorities and had had very important things changed in your community um, surrounding yourself with inspiring things and creating memorable experiences for people. And then as things you wish you learned, oh, the big ones, the healthy boundaries and how to have disagreements in a healthy way, navigating conflicts. Those are really, mm-hmm. really important ones. Yeah, thank you for <laughs> reflecting this back to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing. This was this was really deep, inspiring, and and beautiful. And thank you for again. I'm I'm maybe bar- boring you already with saying thank you for writing this beautiful book. <laughs> Not boring me at all. I'm so grateful. <laughs> thank you so much. This has been a joy, and again, so meaningful to have this conversation yes. on the day of her loss yes. and yes. to be able to. To remember her with so much gratitude and Mm -hmm. love. And, you know, even though there are things I wish I had learned from her, I I, I learned so much beautiful stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm carrying with me today. And and then, yeah, with the with the sort of commitment to continue to give myself those things that she did not give Mm -hmm. me. Mm This is this is how we end my thank you mama workshops mothering ourselves. What can Beautiful. we give ourselves that our mothers didn't? Yeah. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I I'm so honored we we were able to celebrate her here today with her lessons and and I'm sure many listeners will be inspired by her lessons. Thank you so much. Thank you again. <laughs> if you enjoy thank you mama and want to help it grow, please take the two seconds to leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps. If you'd like to get in touch, you can send me a mail at info at thankyoumama.net. You can also find me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter under Anna Tider. that's T-A-J-D-E-R. This was Thank You Mama. Come back next week, subscribe, and tell your friends.